So I like the story um, that I just read about Hannah. And one of the things we see in the story is back in those days, um, having a baby was everything. And back in these days, having a baby is everything. And so uh, she was, she, all she did is desperately want a child. And so she was praying before the Lord, and this was um, going on for a number of years. And so in this first scripture here, it says that um, her husband gave her a double portion, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And a rival provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. So two things are going on here for Hannah. The first thing going on is the Bible says that the Lord closed her womb. Well, that could cause us to be a little mad at God. Well, what would you do that for? doesn't say that Hannah was like that, though. What it says that Hannah did is continually, year by year, parade to the Lord. The other thing that was going on in Hannah's life is she was getting provoked, annoyed, teased, ridicule, whatever that other woman was doing to her. So she had not only to deal with her situation, but also in those days that was culturally acceptable to have more than wife. I don't know what people were thinking personally, but nonetheless, and so the other wife, who the Bible says even though uh, her husband loved Hannah more, the other wife had a lot of kids and just provoked her and teased her year after year after year. Hannah was at her wit's end. But what I love about this story of Hannah is that she continued to pray irregardless. Year after year after year, she was up there at that altar or in that place praying to God, irregardless of who was teasing her or what anybody said. And this is a really important lesson for us in our own prayers is that we believe in perseverance, don't we? Tuesday mornings persevered for 40-some years, as long as it was what started the church Tuesday morning prayer group. So we know about perseverance, and this is what Hannah was doing year after year. And then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Well, why not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? I had to point this out because I like this response from her husband. Ah, forget the baby. What about me? Aren't I better than ten sons? And I'm sure Hannah's saying, just like I put over there, he just doesn't get it. Do you ever have yourself in a situation where you think somebody just doesn't get it, right? So here he was saying, why aren't you eating? Of all things, eat. You're not eating just because of this? Look at me. Aren't I better than that? So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and calls his name Samuel because I have asked for him from the Lord. And I put over this, but for God. And I've titled this, this message this morning, but for God. So Hannah was in a situation that she had done year after year after year and it looked like it was get, going nowhere but for God. But for God, heard her prayer, and I like how Hannah dedicates this child to the Lord. That would have been very difficult. She says, okay, I'll tell you what, God, I'll make you a deal. If you give me a child, I'll give him back to you, and I'll dedicate him to you, and he'll be trained in your house, and he'll be a priest. It says no razor will come to his head, so he'll be a priest for you, and I'll give him back. That would have been difficult as a mom to give your child away like that, but what was happening inside of Hannah's maturity in the Lord? Year after year after year, she was asking for what she wanted. Now all of a sudden, she takes the emphasis, and she says, okay, Lord, how about what you want? How about I give it to you first and then see how you can bless me after that? That's exactly what happened in Hannah's life. Because as she gave that child to the Lord after he was born, the Bible said she went on to have many other children after that. So that was her breakthrough moment. Do you know each one of us has a breakthrough moment? Something that we have been praying about for a very long time, but there's one day when God answers that prayer and that's your breakthrough time. And this was it for Hannah. 
And Samuel, of course, as we know in the Bible, was one of the greatest prophets there ever were. So not only did he open her womb, but the Bible says at that time nobody was really hearing from the Lord. And God used that baby Samuel as he grew to hear from the Lord and become one of the greatest prophets. There's different examples for us in the Bible um, that take this same mindset, that take this same concept that God shows us over and over again, and it's but for God. It's the but for God concept, I call it. Here's another example in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. This was a time where they were taking the wives away. The enemies had come in and taken uh, their wives and their kids away, and the people were mad and upset and grieved, it said. So Whenever we're mad and we're upset, what do we do? Try to blame someone, right? <laughs> Here's what they do. Who can we blame for this? I'm going to blame David. So the Bible says that they wanted to stone him, but what did David do? But for God. It says he too was grieved and worried about this, but for God, he strengthened himself in the Lord. A great example for us how David did this in his situation. And also in Ezra, Ezra says, For we were slaves, yet God did not forsake us in our bondage. He extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And in Psalm 73, My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Ezra's in a situation here where they were slaves. And it says, yet, or that could be, but for God did not forsake us. As Bonnie was saying, he never leaves us nor forsakes us. So here they were slaves, bad situation, um, didn't look good, but for God. What did God do? He didn't forsake them. He showed mercy. He revived them. He repaired the house. In this case, they were building a house for the Lord. But in our own situations, very similar. Sometimes we feel like slaves are in bondage to our circumstance. It consumes us. It's all we think about. It controls us. And just like with Ezra, but for God, what can he do? Be with us. Show us mercy. And how many of you know he can repair the houses of the broken? Amen? He can repair the houses of the broken. I tell about a, a story about how I was in a, we were in a family situation, and it was a desperate situation, and I was praying and praying and praying, and I had gone to this church when we were on vacation, and this man came up to the minister came up as we went to the altar, and he prayed over us, and he said, I see a house that's broken. And I see the windows that are blown out, and it's torn down. But you're to know God's going to repair the house. He's going to fix the broken windows. He's going to fix the broken places. And that's our word for today, that God sees the broken houses. He sees, amen. He sees our situation. But he says to, me, he says to us, he says, I'm going to repair the houses. And so although our situation looks one way, but for God. And he says, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. What was the purpose of the wall? The purpose of the wall was protection, to keep the bad guys out. Well, now we're all told, well, don't build up walls. We don't want to build up walls in the sense of communication and experiences and things like that. But sometimes we need to build up a wall from the outside and the enemy as well. And God becomes our wall. God becomes our protector. We don't have to worry about protecting ourselves. We don't have to fear. We know that God is our wall and he's our protector. And then in Psalms where he says, my flesh and my heart fail, but God is my strength. The times when we're feeling like we're out of strength, when we're feeling despair, when we're feeling there's no hope, that's when we have to say, but God 
is my strength. Because just like in Hannah's situation, what was God after in Hannah's story? I think he was after her heart. I think he was waiting for her to say, you know what, God, you take this. I'll give it to you. I'm giving myself to you, God. It's not about what I want. It's about what you want for me. And when she was able to do that, then God was able to bless her. It's the same way in our own lives. When we're able to say, I feel my heart is failing me. My ways aren't working for me, but for God, let me follow your ways and see how you can work for me. Much different perspective. And another part of this, but for God, and uh, is how um, God, I'm going to give you an example of Joseph now. I know I'm bringing out all these stories, but how Joseph, uh, how God used Joseph's situation for for him. And God sent me, he's, this is in Genesis 45, and he, this is Joseph speaking, and God sent me before you to preserve a pres, uh, posterity for you in the earth, to save your lives by great deliverance. And now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, a lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. The familiar story of Joseph, where his brothers were jealous of him, and when he was out in the field, they took him, they threw him in a pit, just, and then uh, Joseph was rescued by some Egyptians coming by, they took him to Egypt, they made him a slave, and through a number of events, Pharaoh ended up, be, I'm sorry, Joseph ended up being promoted, and this scripture tells us that he says, he has made me a father to Pharaoh, Oh, I always thought it was kind of opposite that way, where Pharaoh became like his father. That's not what the scripture says. So through these situations, as God was training Joseph, he became an example to Pharaoh. That's what a father does, right? He teaches, and he becomes an example. And he becomes, and it says he became a ruler. But it also says in this uh, scripture that uh, God was the one who did it not his brothers. His brothers thought they were getting the last laugh, but he said, it wasn't you who sent me here. It was God who sent me here because he wanted me to save your life. And I put over this, he wanted to train me. And we hear that a lot, how we go through situations and God teaches and trains us. And Joseph's a beautiful example of this. And he continues on, it says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. We've been talking a lot about this at church, how God can work all things together for good. And this is an example. He says to them, you meant evil against me, but God, there it is, but God meant it for good, to not only save their lives, but also their children's lives, and to give them good things. And the Bible says here that, that Joseph spoke kindly to his brothers. Sometimes we're in situations that are tough, and we have to remind ourselves, it's not people that are against us. It's not people that can make our lives difficult, but for God. God allows certain things in our lives, and even though some situations may seem like they're for our bad, God does what? Takes a bad report and turns it into a good report, right? We know that on Tuesday morning, and so this is what he was saying to them. He was saying, you meant something for evil, but God meant it for good. And rather than saying, aha, now look, God promoted me. That's not what Joseph did. Jo Joseph, having the heart of God, said, don't worry, don't fear. I know our father has died, and you think I'm going to take revenge on you, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be kind to you. I'm going to take care of you because God told me to. How many of you know what God says is way more important than what people say? <laughs> way more important. People say one thing, but God says another thing. 
And so for Joseph, that was more important to him, his testimony and his commitment to God than what any person could ever do to him throughout his life, whether it was creating lies over him, whether it was throwing him in a pit, whatever the situation was for him, he stayed faithful to God. And that's what the Lord is speaking to us today is, no matter what happens in our life or what might seem like it's meant for evil, but for God, can turn it around for good. And along with this story of Joseph, what I love about this as well is we can see the generational blessings of how God, again, takes faithful Joseph and blesses him. So I want to take you through this generational blessing that starts really with Abraham, that we know that Abraham, God said to Abraham that he's going to bless them. He told them to be fruitful and multiply, and he's going to bless him and his seed for generations. And we know we're the seed of Abraham, right? So we can read here in Genesis this, that to Isaac, the son of Abraham, and the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in a land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For you and your descendants I will give you all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So this is a time of famine again. There were lots of famines in those days. This was another time of famine. And unlike the situation in Joseph where he ended up in Egypt, wasn't the season for that, was it? Wasn't God's time for that. So what happened here with Isaac? He said, do not go down to Egypt. So he told him the opposite. And then he rehearsed to him the same blessing that he gave Abraham. He's now giving Abraham's son Isaac. And at the end of this scripture, he says, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And you know what? That same blessing that's passed down generation to generation to generation is passed down to us. And I love this because Abraham was the one who planted the seeds. Abraham was the first generation in this regard of this particular promise in this context. And so he said, it's because your father obeyed. I don't know about you, but I want to be that first generation. I want to be the one planting the seeds in my family. So this blessing can be from generation to generation and to generation, just like Abraham did. Amen. And then we see this blessing on to, to Jacob. So there's Abraham, Isaac, and here comes Jacob. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and God of Isaac, the land in which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. This is when the a Lord appeared to Jacob. And if you remember this story, it's when the angels, it's the ladder, or they call it Jacob's ladder, when the angels were ascending and descending. And he was so excited and he heard the voice of the Lord. And this is what I told him. This is what one of the things he told him that I'm going to give you this land. The same thing he told Abraham, the same thing he told Isaac, he was now telling Jacob. So for Jacob, we have to believe that this was a confirmation from Jacob. We put things in our children. I know when my kids were very, very young, I tell, I've told every, each one of my children what the Lord has spoke to me about them. There's one of my kids that, and I always am telling them, you know, the Lord's got this kind of call on your life. Always remember that. Oh, ma. Time goes by. You know, the Lord's got this call on your life. It's just a matter of time. Oh, my. But there's going to be a day where the Lord's going to tell him, I've got this call on your life. And he's going to look and say, oh, pa. <laughs> right? And that's how it works. And this is what was happening here with Jacob. And in chapter 35, he comes again to Jacob and speaks. And also God said to him, I am the God Almighty. Be fruitful, multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, 
and kings shall come from your body, the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac to give to you and your descendants after you, I give this land. He came as a confirmation again in Jacob's life as he was getting ready to go back to the land where he came from. The Lord speaks to us just at the right time, right? With those confirmations or those directional words, and this is what he was doing here for Jacob. So I want to show you the continuity and the consistency of this blessing from generation to generation, which leads his blessing upon Joseph. So now they're reunited. Joseph, through a series of events, gets to see his father again. And the Bible even tells us his father prayed of whether or not he should go to Egypt to see Joseph. And the Lord told him to go. So now he says, Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said, Behold, I will make you fruitful, multiply you. I will make you a multitude of people and give you the land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. So he's repeating what the Lord has said to him. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. What a beautiful story. Here are these sons, born in another land, born by another wife. Uh, I think she would have been an Egyptian. I'm pretty sure about that. And what, he's probably feeling like, wow, I'm not part of the group because here I have, I'm in this other land and this, these kids don't fit, right? But Jacob wanted to make sure he knew no matter where these kids were born, they're born of you, that the same blessing that's on this family is now on your seed, just the way God declared it. Wow, that was Joseph's blessing for persevering, for listening to God, for continuing to follow what God had asked him to do. Now God blesses him. What a blessing. I'm sure Joseph would have thought of that. Well, now what about my kids? I think of the example of one of my sons that is newly married, and his uh, wife that he married had a uh, a two-year-old. She was five when they got married. And do you know the first thing that my son did is adopt that little girl into their family? What a beautiful statement of saying, you belong, not in five years or ten years, but you belong to us now. And that's exactly what Jacob had done for his son Joseph, And I'm sure it meant a whole lot to Joseph to know that his children were counted in that inheritance. And he says, um, and he also just put him into the group, saying that just same inheritance that your brothers have, you have. And if we read the whole story through, we'll see not only that, but guess what Jacob did for Joseph? Like Hannah, what did Joseph get? He got the double portion. He got the double blessing. And his dad told him that. He said, I saved a little bit for you extra. And so I'm going to give you more than I give everybody else. And then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. So he also had this um, blessing that they were going to get the land from the very beginning that God told Abraham about. He is now reiterating uh, to to Joseph right before he dies. And what does Joseph do? He passes that on as he's dying. He says, And Joseph said to his brethren, I'm dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promise continues. This is now the next generation. And when he says to his brother, and I'm thinking he's speaking not only to his own brothers, but to the group of people, to God's people who were promised this land. And in closing, we can see this scripture here that this still continues on for us 
today. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant of God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. I want to get this so deep in our spirit this morning that the same blessing, the same call, the same protection, the same but for God that was on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and on and on through all those generations, the Bible says was on Jesus and now is on us. So when we're thinking this morning about what we need here, and what our burdens are this morning as we come with them, think about this in a way that says, what is my situation but for God? What does God say? So if we have a situation we say, well, the economy's really bad, inflation's going to start, I don't know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck, I don't know what's going to happen, but for God says he's my provision, he's my provider, right? Or our situation is said, I got a bad report from the doctors. He says, I'm never going to do this, or this is never going to happen, or this situation will never be fixed. But for God, he says he's our healer. He says with him nothing is impossible. And we look at our situations, and we see about this situation we're praying for time and time and time and time again. Lord, I keep bringing you the same request. I keep bringing you the same request. And as we learn through Hannah, it's but for God says, through your per perseverance, I will hear you. And even in our situations as we're praying for deliverance and we're, we're praying for our bondages, as it seems like, wow, is this situation ever going to get better? Is this person ever going to stop doing X? Did you ever think that? Are they ever going to stop? Are they ever going to be free? Well, I don't know, it's been a long time, but for God says this is the season he's breaking the chains. Yes, this is the season we can rise up and arise to say, but for God has my life in his hands, and he knows all things. 